What's your thoughts on government cover-ups or covert societies attempting to control humanity? Do you believe in ancient astronauts, intergalactic communication, or extraterrestrial visitations? Ever had an experience with disembodied spirits or the paranormal universe? Are these subjects fact or fiction? Each week, Tony and Eddie explore these unbelievable realities and beyond. Exclusively on Truth Be Told. Hello and welcome to Truth Be Told with Tony and Eddie, where we believe an experience becomes truth. I'm your host, Tony Sweet, and joining me now in studio, your other host, Eddie Connor, and renowned astrologer, Rachel Lang. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Rachel. Most people have had thoughts about whether or not life after death really exists. So once we die, what is the transition period like? Who will greet us on the other side? And is there really white light that escorts us to that realm? And here to explain the afterlife is Mark Anthony, the psychic lawyer, who is a practicing medium who communicates with spirits. He is also a successful attorney, licensed to practice in Florida, Washington, D.C., and impressive before the United States Supreme Court. That is impressive, Tony. So Mark Anthony is also here to share his book, Evidence of Eternity, Communicating with Spirits for Proof of the afterlife. This uplifting journey into the afterlife removes fear and superstition surrounding spirit contact. Mark, or the psychic lawyer as his friends call him, is the author of the bestsellers Evidence of Eternity and Never Letting Go. He will share his personal journey and research with our fans today into the extraordinary world of the afterlife. Please put your hands together and welcome the psychic lawyer and author Mark Anthony. Yay! Mark, how you doing? Hello. Can you hear us? I can. All right, welcome to the show. We are so excited to have you here. Oh, thanks, Tony. It's great being here. And um, I don't know if the listeners know this, but I've been out to your facility at UBN Studios in in uh, Hollywood a number of times, and I absolutely love it, and I just appreciate you having me on the show uh, through Skype today. Oh, of course, and then when you're back in L.A., you're definitely going to be back in studio oh, with us, sir. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, it's it's just too much fun. <laughs> <laughs> I just love it. Well, well, Mark, I, I want to go back uh, to, to start kind of where you began. Uh, you know, we've, we've heard Eddie and Rachel's stories before, you know, they're just baby psychics and so we want to we want to go back and have you tell us your story uh how did you discover that uh that you were a gifted psychic and uh, then starting using it i was about four years old and i started having invisible friends so to speak come and talk to me and i'd sit there and have conversations with them and my parents were cool with it because they could see them too. Oh. And yeah, and and as it turns out, this uh, apparently, and, and this is one of the things I write about in, in my book, Evidence of Eternity, is the genetics and the physiology behind um, but behind people who are mediums and, and psychics. So this runs on both sides of my family. And so my parents didn't treat me like it was odd or weird, but they told me, just don't talk about it to other people, you can talk about it to us. And then throughout my whole life, you know, I'd come home from school and mom would be like, oh, I saw a spirit today. And I'd be, you know, cool. Do we have any peanut butter? Yeah, honey, it's over there. And so it just wasn't looked at. Yeah, it just wasn't looked at as a weird thing. And as I got older, though, I realized that other families weren't quite like us. And uh, I had a really good friend and his family. They were all fundamentalist Christians and they were very nice to us, but they I could tell they were afraid of us. Mm-hmm. And uh and then as I got, uh, you know, to be a teen, I thought it was just cool. You know, it was cool. You know, <laughs> mom was sort of this, you know, Shirley MacLaine, you know, Elizabeth Taylor, Joan Collins type of character. And my dad was a NASA engineer who could hear, you know, dead people. And and uh, I just never thought of it as, as anything but part of my life. And as I got older, it just intensified to the point where this is what I'm doing now full time. Well, so um, are you more... Of a psychic, is that your your biggest strength, or more of a medium, or you've got that great balance between both by chance? Uh, that's a good question. Um, 
my primary focus is spirit communication. So, you know, you ask a lawyer what time it is and we tell you how to build a clock. So, <laughs> <laughs> so in furtherance of your question, primarily I'm a medium. However, every medium also has psychic ability. So I do pick up on, on future events and I can do like medical scans on people. But what I generally do during my readings is I focus on the spirit communication and I rely upon the spirits of, of uh, the client that whom I'm reading for, I rely on their loved ones if if they want to transmit messages of a emotional, physical, uh, personal, or even a future event. So so that's that's how I, I work um, work with uh, future events. I allow the spirits to to tell that to me if that's what they want to do. And how does that work in your law practice? <laughs> Oh boy. Um, <laughs> what was funny is when I got out of law school, my first job, I was a prosecutor. And, uh, and it's funny when, when I say I'm a prosecutor, most people are like, where'd you get your clients? Uh, the police arrested them. <laughs> you know, we're the ones that, that file, you know, that bring the charges against them and try to prove that they're guilty. And so when people get arrested, in, in, in the state of Florida and pretty much everywhere in the U.S., they have to be brought before a judge within 24 hours. It's called an arraignment or a first appearance, depending on what you call it in your jurisdiction. And the, the state, the prosecution always has to be present. And so we have a stack of police reports. Well, they'd bring in the folks that have been in jail all night. And quite frankly, when you've been sitting in the drunk tank or in jail all night, you're looking pretty grungy and rough in the morning. So everybody has a similar worn out, you know, uh, a look. And before I grab the police report, I'd say that one's a sex offender. That one's drunk driving. That one's a drug user. That one's a hooker. That one, you know, excuse me, uh, you know, a uh, charge of, you know, and I would, in in my co-counsel would be like, how do you know that? And it got to be a game with, with uh, the other prosecutors of see if Mark can figure out what they're charged <laughs> with before we show him the police report. And they, they couldn't believe how I was hitting on all that. And then certainly when I, when I select juries, I would get into, you know, people, what they were experiencing and feeling. So it became part of my skill set. And then when it went public, I noticed that there was people that seemed to be visibly afraid of me. And, and I don't want people to be afraid of me. Yeah. This is not an evil power. I'm not Darth Vader. You know, I don't <laughs> want people thinking that I'm going to use this ability to, to harm them in any way because it isn't about that. It's about love and resolution. Mm -hmm. So it certainly um, is a mixed bag bag of tricks because of the way people react to you when you have these abilities. Well, you, it's almost like your family was transported right out of Atlantis <laughs> and then moved over here into the 21st century. And because that's kind of how it was in Atlantis, it was very normal to be intuitive, to be connected, to be a healer, and also to be able to know how to do math and prosecute people. <laughs> but, yeah, know, so we were always looked at sort of as the cool Adams family. Um, <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> so where did you cultivate your sense of humor uh, from? Was it mostly your mom or mostly your dad or just trying to survive? Um, you know what? Both of my parents, uh, my mom's on the other side. She was hysterically funny. Um, dad has a real dry sense of humor. He's still with us. In fact, I'm, I'm privileged. I'm going on the honor flight with him a week from tomorrow. Hmm. And uh, he's a World War II vet and he was one of the original navy seals oh wow. Um, wow yeah yeah and he's battling cancer now and mm -hmm. so um the honor flight what they do is southwest airlines volunteers a flight and it's all um vets who volunteer for this and they and i have to be his guardian so there's 25 vets 25 guardians and they're going to fly us up for an intensive one day to washington dc to take them to all the memorials and and there's a whole lot of activities and surprises that they're not telling us about to honor the vets mm. and um i'm i'm so so privileged to be doing this with my dad and he is so excited and it's really great to see him being this excited uh you know for the first time in a long time you know when you're told that oh you have cancer and the chance isn't very good it's hard to find something to laugh about, but I'll tell you what, dad still maintains a sense of humor. He's cracking jokes every day and, um, and, uh, and, and nothing, nothing will get you through hard times more than a good sense of humor. That's true. Um, 
Yeah, and, and it, it also, scientists have proven how laughter releases endorphins, which reduce tension. And if you think about it, w with certain exceptions, of course, but comedians tend to live very um, long lives. Look at George Burns. Mm -hmm. um, you look at Groucho Marx. You look at Bob mm -hmm. Hope. Um, I mean, you look at... Um, Jerry uh, Lois. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, so many of them. Um, and a lot of them you know, had to be funny to cope with some very serious issues like Robin Williams was, was battling depression his entire life. Uh, you look at like John Belushi and some of the others. So humor is, yeah, it's a defense mechanism. It helps you get through. But on the other hand, sometimes it just feels good to have a, a good hard laugh. Yeah. I'm, I have to, t I, this is probably inappropriate, but hey, it's my show. <laughs> but here, but here's here's why um, I grew up in a kind of a sense of humor household. This so, is why you grew up in a sense of humor household. This is why because <laughs> okay. my my father who has a, an amazing sense of humor. When my mother had breast cancer back in the late '90s, early 2000s, um, I remember picking her up from the doctor and she was crying and she's telling me about. You know, I, they just say, I have breast cancer, and they're going to have to remove my breast, you know, one breast. And, and so I said, okay, and I kept very calm. And so I get her in a car, and I drive her to Dad's work. Uh, this was in Kansas City. And so we get out, I get out, and Mom stays in the car, and I go in. I just lose it. I mean, I lose it. I'm like, oh, my God. Oh, after it. your mom got after, out of the car. Yeah, Mom stayed in the car. Oh. I went into Dad's work. I lost it. And then Dad's like, it's okay. Let's, you know, we'll go out and talk to your mother. And we're out, we go out there, and my dad's like, "Hey," and she tells you know you know what's gonna happen. I'm gonna have to lose a breast. He, breast, and he's like, uh, "That's okay. We'll just call you one tit." Oh, oh my and, lord! But we all just busted out laughing. Oh. My mom laughed, I laughed, and then from that point on, we just dealt with it, and she survived. Mm -hmm. And it's been 14, 16 years later. So you know, it, I agree with you that laughter can mm -hmm. get you through many situations. Hey, child, it sure mm -hmm. do. It sure do. Definitely. It, it does. It does. And, and I've noticed like when I do my events um, where I connect random audience members with loved ones in spirit, I incorporate a lot of humor into it for a couple different reasons. Uh, when I was in England at the, the Arthur Finley Institute for Psychic Science, we did a study and we saw, um, it, okay, they, they set us up in a room. There's like 40 mediums and they had all these cameras which can detect orbs, heat, light, infrared signatures, and they're the same type of cameras that are used in paranormal investigations. Mm -hmm. And for the benefit of the listeners, an orb is a ball of light, which is a spirit. Spirits are a quantum field, an electromagnetic consciousness. And so uh, the instructor, she was from Scotland, and an elderly woman, she goes, now, I want everybody to be singing Silent Night. <laughs> so, we're singing, so we're singing Silent, you know, and it's funny because uh, there's like 14 different languages, you know, <laughs> mediums from all over the world. And we're looking at these screens because it's, you know, showing us what's being detected. And all of a sudden, orbs are coming in. So we're getting all excited. She goes, uh, oh, you like that, do you? Not sing Jingle Bells. We're all like, Jingle Bells, Jingle Bells. <laughs> and the, the screens were flooded with yeah. orbs. And, and so what we found and this was part of the study she was working on, is that being happy, lighter, and brighter creates a more conducive, energetic field. And that's why people who are in a profound state of grief, mm. and they're like, I want to get contact from my loved one! No! <laughs> yeah, and you guys, yeah. all the people that, you know, all of you know that, um, and they never get the contact, it's because without realizing it, they're creating this negative energy barrier. Mm. So when I do my public events, I incorporate a lot of humor because it relaxes people. It's kind of like on Star Trek, when you lower the deflection shields that's what we <laughs> want to do we want to lower the shields and create a conducive environment for spirits to communicate well and you know in your book you uh, evidence of eternity one of your signature theories is referred to as grief crime grief how are grief and crime related it, with the grief crime grief uh, concept is is um, a direct reflection of my work as both an attorney and as a psychic medium, because in both fields, I mean, yeah, all right, as a, as a criminal offense lawyer and a prosecutor, I never met a happy drug addict or alcoholic. <laughs> 
<laughs> right? I mean, you know, you don't right. wake up one day and go, ah, God, my life's perfect. Everybody loves me. I have a good job. I feel good about myself. I think I'll start shooting heroin. Okay. It's a pattern of behavior. It's an, yeah. an escapist feeling. Um, and, and drug addicts and alcoholics are extremely unhappy people. Then I started seeing in my work and in both my careers that in the developmental stages of a person, either as a child or teen young adult, a significant death and that death mm -hmm. isn't dealt with properly it could be a parent a sibling a grandparent even a beloved pet mm -hmm. a close friend because a lot of families don't sit down and say let's discuss this or let's go to our church or synagogue or you know whatever faith community or take you to counseling it's like hey man don't worry about it dude don't think about it you know blah, blah. you cannot you cannot ignore grief and so when the grief is not dealt with properly it's still going to surface within the person, and a lot of people then turn to drugs, alcohol, impulsive behaviors, mm -hmm. predatory behaviors, rage, um, stealing things for that high. So the grief then starts leading them to criminal-type impulses and behaviors. Look at it this way. Someone that's drunk and gets behind the wheel of a car okay, and then they kill somebody. They didn't mean to do that, but they're Grief led to them committing a crime, which has now inflicted grief upon other people. Mm -hmm. And I have seen this thousands mm -hmm. of times. So what I try to do when, when I was practicing law full time is, yeah, you know, they need the drug and alcohol counseling, but let's get to the root of the problem. I mean, I would meet people that were in their 40s and 50s that were still not they they still had not coped with the death of their one of their parents yeah. when they were nine years mm -hmm. old and getting them into the grief counseling it seemed that that was helping them also in the drug and alcohol treatment as well so mm -hmm. grief crime and grief impulsive behaviors drug addictions alcoholism all of those things are are oftentimes intertwined Aren't you shocked, and I'm asking you, of course, Mark, but everybody in the room, too, aren't you shocked about how predominantly in North America we are notorious, our country is notorious for treating huge, huge deep things like grief and death and dying with little Band-Aids or a little oh, pill yeah. here or mm -hmm. a little bit there? It's, it's, it's almost treated surfacy. Mm -hmm. I love how you said we have to get to the root of the problem. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, well, that's part of the problem with Western culture. And to some extent, I'd say that this may, may be in Europe, but definitely in the United States and probably Canada, is we know that we're going to die, but we pretend that we're not going to. It's sort of this, this state of denial. Um, also, mm -hmm. we don't, you know, in, in, in my ethnic background, my, my uh, mother's parents were from Italy, um, there in Italy, if somebody died, uh, let's say um, a woman's husband died, she would wear black for one year out of a sign of respect. Right. Now, people make fun of that now, and I know the Latin mm -hmm. cultures do this, but there's a lot to be said for giving yourself time to grieve, whereas in the United States, you have two bereavement days. Really? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so somebody you love dies uh, on a Monday, and you're supposed to be back at work on Thursday fully functioning? Mm -hmm. Shut up. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And people, you know, we do. We put these little band aids on it, and uh, you know, uh, it 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 needs to have a a more comprehensive approach. Mm -hmm. On on my website, evidenceofeternity.com, there's a page, and it's a free resource open to all people called grief management. And there are coping techniques and suggestions. There's um, different views of uh, the world religions on the afterlife and the soul. But I've found that one of the most important pages is the 10 things to say and the 10 things mm -hmm. not to say mm -hmm. to somebody in grief. You know, you don't go up to someone and go, well, you're young, you'll find somebody else. Oh, you can always have another child. You know, he was an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. It was his fault. She lived a long time. Don't say things like that That's right. and yeah. one of the worst things someone can say is well he's in a better place <laughs> i all hear right. that all yeah. the time yeah. oh <laughs> my god time. it's better to say just like 
I'm so sorry. I don't know what to say, but I'm here for you. Mm-hmm. Hug the person mm-hmm. or say, you know what I always liked about, about your uncle? He told the best stories. Bring up a happy memory or just say, you will be in my thoughts and prayers. Let people know that you care. Don't pass judgment. Don't tell them uh, their child's in a better place. Don't tell them you're young and pretty. You'll find somebody else. Mm-hmm. Don't tell them life goes on without meaning to you're hurting them and and this is is an ignorance which permeates our entire culture that we put these little band-aids on it and it's supposed to be okay mm-hmm. you you wonder why there's so many alcoholics drug addicts and people with explosive behaviors people's feelings mm-hmm. count and need to be need to be addressed yeah well, and, don't, well don't you think you know rachel i think you're aren't you from tennessee uh, from St. Louis, but so, I lived in Tennessee for a long and, time. You know, Eddie's North Carolina, John's Ohio, I'm Kansas. Where we're from, we have nice gestures that we constantly do when someone dies. You know, we bring a cake, we bring food, <laughs> potato salad. Yeah. Potato yeah. salad. I mean, we're you know, we do things yeah. that think that that's what we we've been taught for generations to do. So I we think bring things instead of connect connection. Right. Yes, right. and so I I think those that's a brilliant thing to do is yeah. just learning a new dialogue. Mm-hmm and teaching people a new dialogue instead of old traditions. And you're teaching the dialogue to come from a centered place, a Mm heart-centered place. But, you know, I'm still not... You can't underestimate a really good tray of deviled (laughs) (laughs) eggs. And, you know, that's a nice thing because you're showing up with something, some food. Mm -hmm. You know, food's a gift. You're showing uh, the person who's grieving that you care. Um, And also, like, you know, right after somebody dies, it's nice for for people to bring food because they're devastated. They Mm -hmm. don't want to eat or they they don't feel like cooking. And this, Mm -hmm. this... helps them and it's also a sense of community i mean think about it breaking bread with somebody Mm -hmm. that is a a tradition that humans you know humans as as primeval beings Mm -hmm. you know five six ten thousand years ago the idea of sitting around a fire eating together it's a communal thing and it's it's a symbol of 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 camaraderie and of love so i think that's a that's a wonderful tradition. There's a lot to be said for these old traditions, but in our texting instant gratification society, right. you know, we that's think true. we can just whiz through it. You can't. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. that's true. In in your experience, Mark, um, you know, you you mentioned that your mother has passed, and and you work. Uh, I've seen your videos, and and I've I've I've, I've you know seen your work, um, and you work with a lot of people who are deep in a grief process. Do you find that in your own experience and in the experience that you have working with others, that communication with loved ones who've crossed over is a helpful part of that process? Absolutely, Rachel. I find that spirit communication is an important therapeutic step in the journey through grief. Now, is it a be-all and end-all? I mean, I wish I had the proverbial Harry Potter wand that I could just wave over somebody and, you know, just pop the grief right out of them. <laughs> you know? I mean, wouldn't that be great? It's like, yeah. ooh, you know. Um, but, but it doesn't work that way. Yeah. And, and when somebody dies... Um, it, I recommend that you don't engage in spirit communication for about four to six months. And it's mm-hmm. not because the spirit can't communicate. They can communicate right away. You're not ready, even though I want this contact. Well, if you're hysterical crying and, and just going ballistic during the reading, you're not going to get anything out mm-hmm. of it. Mm-hmm. Initially, you have to deal with the the shock that that first couple weeks where you you feel like you're not really in your body you're just sort of watching everything go by it's like being in a conscious nightmare and then and that's what's known as the shock phase there there's stages of grief but there's two phases and the shock phase is the immediate phase where i can't believe this happened i can't believe she's dead i can't believe i can't believe well that fades after a couple weeks but then the trauma sets in mm-hmm. and trauma is what we deal with for the rest of our life and you need to reach out to your faith community, your family, your friends. If you don't want to uh, turn to a faith-based approach, then go to secular counseling, grief support groups. Um, And then it's going to come to a point where stability, emotional stability, it doesn't mean you're happy and everything's wonderful, but it means you're past the initial shock and the hysterical phase. And that's when making communication with a loved one is part of the overall approach. So the way that I look at it is coping with grief is an interdisciplinary approach that requires faith, psychology, um, love, family, togetherness, and then the spirituality and the spirit communication. Hmm. Wow, that is so good. Mm -hmm. That is so good. 
And so we're going to go to a break. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to Truth Be Told with Tony and Eddie. I'm Eddie Connor. I'm Tony Sweet. I'm Rachel Lang. And I'm JW. And we have Mark Anthony here. He's When we come back, we're going to ask you why you wrote your book, Evidence of Eternity, Mark. And we can't wait to see you back in about 30 seconds. Be right back. United States Pharmacopeia USP sets the standard for most food supplements and are used in over 95% of all vitamin and mineral supplements in the world. The problem is that these products have never appeared in any living tissue. They're created in laboratories and are not recognizable to the body's metabolism. Grown by Nature products are different because they use renatured ingredients, proprietary blends of essential vitamins and minerals with cofactors of proteins, lipids, and complex carbohydrates. Over 50 studies have been conducted on renatured nutrients, and over 20 have been published in peer-reviewed journals proclaiming their superiority. As a result, Grown by Nature vitamins and supplements are now recognized as simply the best available. Call 877-817-9829. That's 877-817-9829 and order your Grown by Nature products today. We are what we eat, and since we are of nature, we should eat foods in their natural form. Only Grown by Nature offers a full line of renatured nutrients. Call 877-817-9829. That's 877-817-9829 because not all products are grown by nature, but they should be. But they should be. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Truth <laughs> Be Told with Tony and Eddie. I'm Eddie Connor. I'm Tony Sweet. I'm Rachel Lang. And I'm JW. And we have with us the remarkable Mark Anthony, the psychic lawyer. We're talking about his book, The Evidence of Eternity. And during the commercial break, we were all sitting here chewing the fat about how fabulous you are, Mr. Mm-hmm. Anthony. <laughs> gosh. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, I appreciate that. But, you know, I don't, uh, you know, thank you. I appreciate that. It's You're so welcome. rare to find a heart-centered attorney. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like, you know, <laughs> um, well, the, the, the hard part of, of practicing law is is that a lot of aggressive personalities are drawn to the law. And mm-hmm. I'll never forget when I saw that movie um, was a devil's advocate with Canal Reeves and, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and Al Pacino and Al Pacino plays the devil. And Canal Reeves goes, why? Why the law? And he goes, because it puts us in everything. And I thought about it. It's like, well, what business, what anything mm-hmm. exists without legal regulations, guidelines? I mean, everything from the space program to picking, you know, cantaloupe has some type of legal regulation to it and you get all these aggressive people in it but you know when lawyers we get together we talk and it's like well we're not the ones that start the trouble our clients start it (laughs) our clients pick fights with each other and then they get us in there but then it turns into it goes from being about justice and truth to who's got more power who's got Mm -hmm. more leverage and who can outmaneuver who and that's the sad part, is that truth, justice, and the American way sounds nice, but all too often it's the casualty in a battle of, of ego-driven agendas, money, and control. Mm-hmm. So, you know, our ideal uh, of, of justice is inspirational, but all too often our system of justice is a joke. Mm-hmm. That's true. That, mm-hmm. it, that is true. Did you see the HBO uh, series, The Night Of?, no, I, I didn't catch that one. Well, it's it, it, there were some. There was only eight shows in the series, and I found myself yelling at the TV <laughs> because uh, you have the opposing counsel that everything they see, they only see it in the way that proves their case, even though they and they'll they'll word it in the way that proves their case, even though it's completely questionable, unethical, or isn't a match. And then the other people are seeing it only in the way to prove the innocence. It's like Democrats and Republicans right now, but I'm not going to go there. <laughs> so, well, I, I think the People versus O.J. Simpson with Cuba Gooding Jr. and John Travolta, Nathan Lane, and um, uh, what's his name, David Schwimmer. Yeah. Um, oh, my God. When I was watching that, it was like I thought that was one of the best – depictions of what it's like to be in a big trial Mm -hmm. and how there's this tug of war and the ebb and the flow and all the dirty tricks and the incompetent judge and and you know the 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 lying witnesses i mean i just thought that that gave everybody such a good taste and i remember when the oj simpson trial was going on because back in, in those days i was acting as a legal analyst on a number of news programs and um the O.J. Simpson trial 
bared the ugly truth of everything that is wrong with our society mm. and our system of justice. But the good thing that came out of it is that our domestic violence laws were completely revamped. Mm. Because before that, if a woman would make a complaint or, or anybody made a complaint against a spouse or a partner that was victimizing that person, it was like, well, we can't do anything, we can't do anything, we can't do anything. And we started seeing a lot of these victims mm. showing up dead just like Nicole Brown Simpson, yes. and uh, and he did it. I mean, there's no doubt that he did it. Um, it's just that he had the better lawyers, the and and they 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 used every dirty trick in the book, and it worked. And what's come out of that is a greater awareness of the severity and 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 how horrible domestic violence is. And now victims are actually being the focus because the criminal justice system is just that. It's a justice system for criminals. And victims need to be the first priority. Wow, that's so, and that's it in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. That's it in a nutshell. Uh, so, Evidence of Eternity, your book. Why did you write it? When I was on the my first book, Never Letting Go, is a guide on the journey through grief, and and I was on the Never Letting Go tour, and people started asking me questions about crime and homicide and suicide and reincarnation, and is there a scientific basis for this, um, and how can you prove this? So I started keeping track of of all of these very profound questions, and I decided then to write the book that I've wanted to write my entire life, which explains. The other side, you know, heaven, nirvana, the afterlife, whatever you want to call it, spirit communication based on science, quantum physics, human physiology, wow. evidence, mm -hmm. and faith. And to show that people of science and people of faith are not mutually opposed to each other, but that they're actually on the same page. Wow, that's a nice yeah. integration. That mm -hmm. is. And did you study a lot of, like, religious beliefs or religious ideas or faith-based uh, ideas about the afterlife and writing the book? Absolutely. And I was supposed to be a Catholic priest. I was raised in, <laughs> in my family's Catholic. Yeah, and I, I know. And I, that was something as a kid. I always wanted to be a priest and all that. And, and all right, since we're on a relatively adult show, when I hit about 16, I was like, yeah, not so sure. But just to be honest, spirituality and, and, and the drive. So my entire life, um, I've always studied religion. I've studied Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, Native Americanism, Taoism, Shintoism. Wow. Uh, I just loved studying um, religious beliefs, and I started seeing the commonality and the the the, the um, the common themes mm -hmm. and the concepts that run through all of them. And then in my study of quantum physics, I started seeing, wait a second, people in the first century AD uh, that were writing the New Testament and people, you know, 4,000, you know, 4,000 years ago, the sages of India were writing and discussing these concepts based on the terminology and what they were familiar with during the day. And then I started seeing, like, every belief system talks about the soul. In other words, who and what we are, mm -hmm. our consciousness, mm -hmm. our soul, pre-exists the body, comes into the body, and then moves on. And then I started seeing in physics, energy is neither created nor destroyed, only transferred from one form to another. Mm -hmm. And then I started uh, my understanding of light from a quantum physics and particle physics standpoint and how every great religious teacher has talked about perceiving God in terms of light. And we find now that everything in the universe is composed at a subatomic particle level of quanta, which is electromagnetic energy. Everything. You, me, the computers we're looking at, the air we breathe, the space between the Earth and the sun, the sun itself, the frozen, you know, comets out in space. Everything is composed of quanta, electromagnetic energy. So when all the religions talk about how we're all, particularly Hinduism and Buddhism, talk about how we're all interconnected and how Jesus said that we're all the children of God and that we're all cells in the body of God, well, now... We're on the path to actually proving that on a quantum level. Mm -hmm. So it, with all of your studies of spirituality, physics, and religions, when do you think a lot of religions, and let's say North America, started to push out spirituality 
and started to create a little set of laws that would kind of manipulate people more than get them to stay in touch with their intuition and spirituality. And maybe a better question is, why are so many religions dead set against psychics? Because, oh, wow. Okay, we could do a whole show just on this. Um, <laughs> it's not just in North America. Okay. This started back in, in biblical times. Let's go to the book of, of Samuel. Okay. And in the book of Samuel, um, King Saul, who, you know, David's popularity is on the rise, the Philistines are on the march, things are not going well for Saul, and he, his trusted advisor was the prophet Samuel who had died. And so he wanted counsel from Samuel, so he went to the witch of Endor, who we now know to be a medium, and through her, Samuel came and told Saul that his time was at an end, and, and basically that was it for him. And then right after that, he's defeated in battle, his sons are slain, David um, becomes the king of Judea, and then Saul, I believe, commits suicide. So the rabbinical community in ancient Judea said, see what happens when you talk to those people? And so it started becoming... Um, in, part of of what we call the old testament or the ancient jewish tradition that mediums are not of god and you have to go mm -hmm. through us and then in the first century a.d um about 100 years after jesus dies the new testament is written and what started happening is the early christians believed in reincarnation and believed in a lot of of what we would almost consider new age and, and more like buddhist hindu type concepts but um, the beliefs in reincarnation were eliminated at the Fifth Ecumenical Council in five, I think it was 527 uh, or 532 AD um, by the Roman slash Byzantine Emperor Justinian. Long story short, once the Romans got hold of Christianity, they turned it into an extension of imperial authority. And they said that Jesus will return, and until he does, the Emperor of Rome is, is God's representative on earth and equal to the apostles. And if you do not listen to the Emperor, Emperor, God's representative on earth, you will now be punished for all of eternity. So it created this very fear-based, very Roman concept. So religion and spirituality then got hijacked by um, by governments and by ego-driven agendas, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and psychics and mediums are telling people you don't need a book or a church or uh, or somebody telling you what to think. Mm -hmm. You can connect directly to God, and so religions say no, no, no. You can't do that. You can only get to God through our clerics, through our dogma, through our procedures. And by the way, you need to give us ten percent of your income. Yeah. And if you don't, you're going to go yeah. to hell. Yeah. And can I and add? If you can don't, I add? You're going to go to hell. Can I add one to one chapter to that story? Because I because uh, I, I studied theology and got my master's in theology, but the the Vatican, the, the Catholic Church, actually had their own astrologers and their own mediums. Really? The, yes. the ancient yes. Jewish tradition. Hmm. That in fact, um, ancient Jewish priests would carry these dice, these like divining dice hmm. that they would roll. So everything like it was okay if you were seeking consult with a medium or an astrologer within the organization. Yeah, oh, how funny. But then they were <laughs> using it. To enforce power and 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 to get money out of out of people, and Martin Luther said, "No, no, we got to stop this." Yeah, and then they go well, they oh, exactly. <laughs> and and what was happening <laughs> is crazy. when you were a member of the clergy and you had these abilities, you then became a saint. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there's the, to, to this day there are healers in the Catholic Church who are performing prophecy and spirit communication, but they're they're um, sanctioned by the church, mm -hmm. and so. The Vatican's been very well aware of these abilities for centuries. It's just that it's okay as long as it's through our guidelines. And that was that was part of the problem that I had as a young man uh, and deciding not to go into the clergy because I didn't I got tired of hearing, well, the teachings of the church say this and you can't do this and you can't God is not limited. Nothing spiritual is controlling. There is mm. much more to all of this than a book. A, a, a building, um, and, and I like what George Harrison, the, the late great Beatle, said. He said one of the reasons he left Catholicism and became a Hindu is he said, I, I like the direct experience because as a Hindu, having psychic and spiritual experiences is part of your journey as opposed to Christianity where it's just believe what we're telling you. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Or else. Or, uh, <laughs> or else. Yeah, there's always the negative, fear-based, you know, I mean, this, this nonsense with the devil. I mean, I, I, all, all day long, I, you know, my, my assistants, they're pulling these ridiculous things. People write, you're satanic. The uh, Bible says this. Mm-hmm. It's like, really? There's mm-hmm. a guy with a pitchfork running around sticking yeah. in the butt making you do <laughs> things. Yeah, but, um, but yeah, the, myst- the, mystical tradition, the mystical traditions of most religions, though, do honor the gifts and... And so I think there are aspects sure they of do. religion. Sure they do. And, and that's even in the Bible. In Romans 12, verses 6 through 8, we all have gifts from God. And if your God is one of prophecy, then thou shalt prophesy. Mm-hmm. And, and then there's a book of Timothy, Do Not Fear the Gift. Um, I think there's a, a, a book in Peter about the gift is not one of fear. So there is se- there are several passages. So what happens is people like to, I call it um, salad bar Christianity, where you go yeah. up to the salad bar and you pick and choose what you want, okay? I'll pick this stone to cast judgment, you know, instead yeah. of looking at it as a whole, okay? Because, I mean, the Bible has been used to justify genocide, slavery, yeah. oppression of women, mm-hmm. warfare, I mean, the most horrific things imaginable. Mm-hmm. But the fact of the matter is, in the Bible, where we're good guys, we're prophets and prophetesses, and where we're bad, they call us witches and mediums. So, mm-hmm. it, you know, you have to look at also, and you have to look at it in the context that it was written and it just when people say you know the bible is the word of god it's like really which version which yeah. version of the bible yeah but, i mean there's 20 26 different versions of the bible so, so which one's the, the true one it's, uh, it always drives me crazy when i hear that because they're a regurgitating regurgitating mm-hmm. regurgitating five generations of the same bs that's belief systems yeah and then they they memorize that, and they're not feeling anything in yeah. them, in their own heart, their own mind, their own soul. They're just being little robots, and mm-hmm. that's so dangerous. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But it's, which leads me to this question here: It's like, uh, what makes evidence of eternity different from other books written by psychics? But I think you might have already answered that about seven times. Yeah, I, I, I believe that I have because it, it explains this on the basis of science yes. and, and logic mm-hmm. and reality as opposed to just believe this. Because the problem with a lot of a lot of uh, my colleagues in the, the psychic world is they too fall prey to the primitive fear-based superstitions. And also, will spirit tell me this and spirit tell me that and da 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 And see, I don't refer to God as spirit. I refer to God as God and that there are spirits all around us and and that there is a logical basis for all of this. I mean, when I start hearing people talking, oh, they are earthbound spirits. It's like, oh, <laughs> stop it with that. I mean, uh, next thing you know, you're going to be throwing Deuteronomy all over me. I mean, it's like, just stop it <laughs> that, that fear based nonsense. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. A lot of the Christians believe that uh, the mediums are communicating with unfamiliar spirits or spirits that are posing to be good, but they're actually evil and i'm like well if they're if the person on the other end who is receiving the healing uh from com- communicating with the person who's passed over and it's a healing loving uh exchange how could evil uh, yeah that sounds like that sounds like a real satanic objective yeah, to me doesn't yeah. it yeah make you feel better and understand that god exists heaven exists your soul's yeah. an immortal living spirit and the teachings of jesus were correct yeah that sounds real satanic <laughs> you know, i mean you hear the, this gobbledygook because i had somebody write me this you're talking with familiar spirits about well yeah they're familiar because i um, the, when i describe them to the client i'm reading for they know them because that's their loved ones yeah. Yeah. and and it, it's like the people that invent these ridiculous familiar mm-hmm. spirits and demonic things i mean really you have that much time on your hand to wallow in the the the, the muck of, mm-hmm. of of superstitious nonsense mm-hmm. what you have to realize is that once again we're all energy mm-hmm. and god's gift to all of us is our individuality and that our individual soul consciousness when it separates from the body is like a drop of water that falls into this ocean yeah. which is this pure energy and now there's a collective consciousness yet we retain our individuality and in one of the chapters in evidence of eternity is the collective consciousness 
disconnect, which explains how a spirit and why they disconnect from that to make communication with loved ones here. And so what you have to look at is that the people who are making up these things are still um, mired in Bronze Age and Iron Age backward primitive superstition. Mm -hmm. And it, it's just absolutely uh, absurd. And you know, when people say, oh, it's familiar spirits and it's evil, it's like, okay, look, here, I'll tell you the difference. When I hear messages that I convey to somebody that's from their loved one and I can describe what they look like, their name, facts about them, things going on in your life, and send you messages of love, healing, resolution, mm -hmm. that's from God, that's spirit communication. Yeah. When I hear voices which say, take axe and go kill, that's paranoid <laughs> schizophrenia. <laughs> and that, it's a mental illness. Uh -huh. Ergo, it is not yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I want to ask the, the religions that you had studied, uh, and I, I've heard many times, you know, if, if the UFOs arrive or I'm, I'm, they said, oh, the religions will, you know, disband. And but mm. th with all the religions you've studied, is there one religion that you feel that would remain intact a thousand, two thousand years from now where I see some religions not just disbanding, where people just completely walk away from it. Now, even Christianity, I, I mean, there's so many people in droves that are leaving because if there's so so much judgment mm -hmm. there. So do you feel that there is a religion or religions that you feel that would uh, survive, you know, a thousand, two, three thousand years from now? And then if it does survive or doesn't survive, what do you think is next? I think Buddhism mm -hmm. would be the most likely to survive because the Buddhists, and, and, and I love Buddhism because you never hear about Buddhist terrorists, do you? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, you, you know, Buddhism is, is a nonviolent, and, and, and in some ways it's the whatever religion. It's like, it's okay if there's a God, and if you don't want to believe in God, that's okay, and if there's an afterlife, um, that's okay, and if you don't want to believe in it, that's okay, but uh, we're all energy and we come back through a succession of lifetimes. And and if all of a sudden, you know, the aliens started coming, and hopefully they're going to be E.T. and not the Klingon Empire. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> or the Borg, right. you know, right. or whatever. Or, or, you know, Darth Vader and the, the Empire or whatever. Um, yeah, hopefully Yoda, not Darth. Mm -hmm. um, the Buddhists would be like, this is wonderful. This is supposed to happen. Okay? And... The Christians, and recently the Vatican, and it actually it's, it's more than recently, it was back during the, uh, the last days of Pope John Paul II, they, they issued a decree that it's okay to believe in extraterrestrial life because human beings cannot put limitations on the creative power of God. All right, there we go again. The Vatican's well aware of a lot more things. So Christianity might adapt, but I think what we would have is we would have a lot of the fear-based, uh, the fundamentalist and, um, and the, the hate-mongering type religions would either become an extremely xenophobic thing that's saying that these are really demons making an attack on Earth, and I really hope that that's not what happens. But uh, I would also, uh, I would like to think that there may be a melding of, of religions to a higher consciousness and a purpose. And that's where, like, the, the lectures that I'm giving on my upcoming uh, Mayan cruise, um, mm -hmm. and, I, and the one that I gave in the, the Sedona Spirit Symposium, is I'm going to be talking about the science of spirit communication based on quantum physics. And what I think would happen in that, that context, in that scenario about aliens coming to our world, is that mm. science and faith, the fear-based ridiculousness, uh, dogmatic nonsense is going to fall apart uh, fall away from the religion, and we're going to get more into the philosophical and the spiritual components of it. And in science, the negativistic um, existentialism, the, oh, there is nothing that you can't put under a microscope, uh, thought processes are going to melt away, and you're going to have a more enlightened way of looking at this. So it's a great question. Great question. Mm -hmm. that, that's one question nobody's ever asked me before, and <laughs> I appreciate that. Anytime. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so, in Mark, in your, uh, the first chapter of Evidence of Eternity, it's titled Spiritual Situational Awareness, and it actually starts out on 9-11. So what do you mean by spiritual situational awareness, and why did you start your book out on a day like 9-11? 
Uh, situational awareness is a skill that every police officer, or every soldier, marine, sailor that I've ever known says saved their lives. And, and being raised by a guy that was a Navy SEAL, um, dad's thing was be aware. Be aware of what's around you at all times because you never know if it's going to save your life. And boy, was he right. And then spiritual situ situational awareness is the realization and the acknowledgement that there are not just material world influences around us, but there are also spiritual ones. The reason that Evidence of Eternity starts on September 11th is because one of my cousins was in an elevator when one of the planes hit. Oh. And if, if he did not have the inclinations um, of our family, he would have died. Yeah, because it was spiritual situ situational awareness that got him out of that, and um, the whole nine eleven thing it, it, it hits all of us, but my family in particular, and so it it really drove home that you have to be aware of both the seen and unseen forces, energy, and situations around us at all times. Mm -hmm. Wow, That's and we amazing. little we have like two minutes left, but I have two more questions. Where can we get your book? Um, all fine bookstores, Barnes and Noble, um, um, any spiritual bookstore, and and uh, on my website, evidenceofeternity.com. Get it from Amazon.com, Walmart.com. Um, also on evidenceofeternity.com, click on the tab that says Psychic Explorer Cruise. I'm leading a cruise um, from October 22nd to the 27th aboard the Royal Princess from mm. Fort Lauderdale yeah, to Costa fun. Maya. We're going to these spiritual locations, and on the sea days, I'll be doing readings and uh, lectures on the science of spirit communication and the mystical Mayans. Ooh. How, how many That's days good. at sea are there on this cruise? Is it seven days or ten? I'm sorry. Oh, it's a five-day cruise, five. and there's two sea days, one going, and then we'll be in, and I've already signed up for the excursions to the Mayan ruins. I mean, this is going to be like being in an Indiana mm. Jones spiritual movie slash Hyatt Regency. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, because, you know, I want, I want people to have fun and be comfortable. Plus, this is one of the newest and most beautiful ships in the world. It's only like a year old, oh, and... Um, and then on the, the, the C-Day back, I'll be giving a talk on quantum consciousness, the science of spirit communication, and then later in the day doing gallery readings, connecting random audience members with loved ones in spirit. And that's all on my website, evidenceofeternity.com. Perfect. And then Very your cool. schedule is all there, too, so we'll know when you're heading back to uh, Los Angeles. Yes, um, we're, okay. we're definitely working on getting back to L.A. I absolutely love California, love L.A. Um, not so big on the traffic, but, <laughs> but I learned something. I learned something. When you're sitting on a mountaintop in Sedona, it's real easy to be all spiritual. When you're stuck in a traffic jam in Beverly Hills uh -huh. and you got to get to an appointment in 10 minutes and you know it's going to take an hour and a half, that's yeah. the real test. Yes, <laughs> it is. So we have one more real test, and that is if you're sitting in traffic in the valley in Reseda and you're an hour and a half late, that makes it harder. Yeah, and you get there, and it's like, oh, parking? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. another right. test. So true. But, but that, that's, that's the whole thing. It's very easy to be enlightened in a spiritual, beautiful mm -hmm. environment. It's taking those lessons and applying them to living in the material world, mm -hmm. and that's the spiritual test. For each and every one of us, we have to practice what we preach. Mm -hmm. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Well, Mark, thank you. thank you so much. We have so much more to talk about the next time you come in town. So please, 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 when you get here, make sure you let us know, okay? He's great. All right. Thank you for having me on. I really appreciate that. All right. Mark thank Anthony, you, Mark. everybody go to evidenceofeternity.com, and uh, we'll talk to you soon, Mark. Super. Take care, right. everybody. God you, bless you. God bless you, you too. too. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Oh, my God. He was amazing. Mm -hmm. he amazing. Uh, yeah. Rachel, before we go, again, promote uh, where yes. people can vote for you. Everybody go vote um, for my South by Southwest panel, When Worlds Collide, Astrology Meets Music. Um, let's let's bring more spirituality into places where you wouldn't necessarily suspect it. Um, <laughs> right. so it's panelpicker.sxsw.com uh, forward slash vote, or you could find it on my web, uh, my Facebook page, which is Rachel Lang 11. And if you want to get a, an amazing 
uh, reading and your chart yeah. done, astrology chart yeah. done, go to Rachel Lang. Mm-hmm. Thank go you. Go to blissenup.com. Blissenup.com is my website. Thanks. All right. Well, we Thank are you. out of here, guys. Uh, another great show, and I hope you guys enjoy it. Please let us know uh, on YouTube, on any of our outlets, iTunes, iHeart. We'd love to hear from you. Let us know what you think. Again, always let us know who you want to have on the show. Again, we've been hearing a lot. Uh, of comments and of a lot of suggestions. So we take those to heart and we will check into it. And uh, Rachel, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I love being with you guys. Thank Thank you so so much. All right. Well, we're out of here. So see you next time, John. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. And we'll see you next time on Truth Be Told with Tony and A. I'm Tony's mate. I'm Eddie Connor. Rachel Lang. JW. Out. Hey, thank you for listening to Truth Be Told with Tony and Eddie right here on Universal Broadcasting Network. Make sure you go to our iTunes page. Just type in Truth Be Told with Tony and Eddie. Listen to us on iHeartRadio. Again, Truth Be Told with Tony and Eddie. And go to our YouTube channel, subscribe, and please, please, please leave a comment. We'd love to hear from you. So please support our sponsors and make sure you listen to us every Friday right here on Universal Broadcasting Network from 4 to 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Until then, have a good week. Thank you.